We have a huge church when you count all them kids. A lot of kids. Oh, love you, babe. He has to pick Bree up early on every other Monday, so he does the praise and worship in the least. Um, okay, so I wanted to share with you guys a little bit. Um, you know, over the last few weeks, I've been kind of uh, just encouraging you all in uh, giving and in your finances and trusting God and, and um, you know, really learning how to rely and depend on him in every way and, you know, financially as well. And, um, you know, I was telling you guys some different testimonies and stuff. And I just, um, you know, the Bible talks about don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on. You know, don't worry about these things. These are the things that the heathen and the unbelievers worry about. These are not things that we worry about. And why does he say that? He says that because we as Christians, as believers, he has put us here on this earth on a mission. And we're like soldiers in an army with a um, divine commission from him and a, and a divine assignment. And, you know, a soldier, when they're in the military and when they're in the, when they're serving our country, they do not worry about where their next meal is coming from. They know that their military, their, you know, upper people are going to take care of them. They have everything, uh, you know, needed for food and for where they're going to be staying that night is all figured out by the higher ups. And, you know, they don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. And, you know, a lot of times we, we get into this mentality, like we're having to provide for ourselves and like we're having to take care of ourselves and we're out there on our own. And, um, this is not the this is not the mentality that God wants us to have because he sees us as his sons and his daughters and he sees us as his children and everybody here has children except for Dorothy. <laughs> Sorry Dorothy. <laughs> you sort of have children, you know? Yes. So no no children are sitting there wondering Oh, where is my next meal going to come from? Where is my next snack going to come from? And for some reason, you know, when we grow up, we change our mentality to thinking that we are, we are now, we don't have anyone to depend on or rely on. We only have to depend and rely on ourselves. And Jesus constantly, he said, that, let, let the little children come to me. That if, that if we want to, if the greatest person is the one who has the most childlike faith. And so, he wants us to come to him like children, like innocent, pure children who have not a worry and not a care in the world. And this works. The word of God works. And it works in the area of finances too. And I, I've seen it over and over and over again. And, you know, people don't like it. They call it the prosperity gospel or whatever. They don't like it. But the truth is that the word of works when it comes to every area and this includes finances i've seen it in my own life over and over and over again um god providing debt being you know debt cancellation those are things we need to be believing for for um divine de debt cancellation for um creative uh outlets of income for uh special deals we should have favor everywhere we go where we get discounts where we get um where we get free stuff given to us. These are things that we should expect as children of God. These are things that we should um, know that our Father wants to give to us. And if there's a miss, and if, and if you're not experiencing that, then you can't say, well, it just doesn't work. You know, I've done everything I know how to do and it doesn't work. Well, then did God not keep his promise? Does God not take care of you? Is God unfaithful? Because we have to be real careful because sometimes we get with this mentality like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and it doesn't work. And what happens? We start pointing the finger at God. Like, God, you're not faithful. And God, you said, and I'm, I'm so righteous and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing and you're not providing. And we become like the Israelites who pointed their finger at God, who saw miracle after miracle, divine uh, you know, intervention in multiple ways. And yet they had so much unbelief that they couldn't, they, they didn't end up going into the promised land because they had so much unbelief and they pointed their finger at God and they accused God. And if we're not careful, we get into this. 
Because we start hearing about the word and we start hearing about, you know, um, what belongs to us as believers and that God, it's God's will for us to prosper and poverty is under the curse. And we start hearing this and we're like, okay, but you know, God, I'm tithing and God, I'm going to church and God, I'm, I'm giving and I'm doing all these things that you told me to do and it's not working. I'm still having this problem. And if that's your mentality, then I just want to challenge you to rethink everything because with this mentality, we are not coming to him as a son or a daughter. We are coming to him as a victim of him. And that's a dangerous and scary place to be because like I said, the Israelites, they didn't get to go in. There, there came a point where God was like, I'm done with you. And thank God for grace and mercy that none of us are at the point where God's like, I'm done, I'm done with you. He's not done with any of us. But if we're not careful, we miss out on the promised land of what he has for us for he we miss out on his best for our lives and so you know if something's not working in your life and specifically in the area of finances i challenge you to stop looking at this as a religious checklist of principles in which you've learned about faith or about finances that you have been applying and i encourage you to go and seek the provider himself to go seek the face of Jesus because here's the thing you can do everything right you can do everything right you can go through your ordinances and your checklist but let me remind you that when Jesus came and when he said come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest I used to never understand that because I was like well for my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light I used to never understand that because I was like, well, how is his yoke light? Like how, how, so he's saying he is a burden? He's a burden? No, here's what he's saying. He's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the people who were weary and heavy laden of bearing the, the law and all of the rules and mandates and regulations and checklist of to do's. And he was coming to those people and he was saying, look, listen, forget about that stuff. Come to me. If you're weary, you're heavy laden, you're burdened down, come to me and I will give you rest. He didn't say, come do A, B, and C, make sure you pay your tithes, make sure you go to church and I'll give you finances. No, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. And I've been on this thing of rest lately because rest is the thing that most Christians are missing. They learn the word of God, they understand the scriptures, they know the principles, they've heard it all their life, they've gone to church a million times, and yet they are the most stressed out, miserable, cranky, cheap, if you ask any server at any restaurant, Sunday afternoons are the worst, tip days for them, cheap because they already paid their tithes, they're not going to be generous out anywhere else. You ask people, and they'll tell you this, and yet we see Christians are the most miserable group of people on the planet. They're, 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 they're not, you, there's a lot of unsafe people who are a lot nicer than Christians. They're a lot more pleasant than Christians. They, they go and they take their happy pill and they get drunk and they do whatever and that gives them the temporary joy and the temporary satisfaction. Why are we as Christians who have access to the well that never runs dry, why are we so dry? Why are we so depleted? Why are we scraping the bottom of the barrel just to barely get by? You know, this is supposed to be about finances, but finances is just a tiny piece of this because the well that never runs dry has everything you need. It has peace, it has rest, it has abundance, it has provision, it has everything, healing, everything that you need, it's, it's there, it belongs there, but it's in the face of Jesus himself. And so, so many Christians have gotten so many so busy with the, the duties of Christianity that they've forgotten about coming to him when they're weary and heavy laden and they become so uptight and so accusational and so judgmental and so angry and so and trust me i know there is we're supposed to be like jesus there is a time and a place to get angry and there is a time and a place to be nasty but it's not a very good witness to the world when the joy of the lord is supposed to be your strength and you're walking around with a scowl on your face and you're 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 not living up to what you believe and Jesus would call that a hypocrite. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it didn't bear any fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, 
This isn't going to sound very nice, but if you're not bearing fruit, the problem is not God. The problem is you. It's you. You're the problem. God's not the problem. So we need to stop pointing our finger at God and saying, God, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. And listen, I've been there so many times where I'm like, God, what is my problem? I'm laboring in the word. And just as a little side note, in Hebrews 4, when it talks about laboring to enter into the rest, and then in Matthew 28, 11, where it says, come to me, all you who are laboring, weary, heavy, weary and heavy laden. Those are the word there, labor. They both use the word labor. The word labor there, in English, labor means the same thing. But in the Greek, labor doesn't mean the same thing. In one place where it says, all you who labor, so if you're toiling, you're striving, you're struggling, you're miserable, you're not in rest. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Now, when it says in Hebrews 4, that we labor to enter into the to the rest, that word labor is not a toil, it's not a striving, it's not a, that's a, it means diligence. So be diligent in the word. It does not mean, if you're, do, if you're saying, if you're saying, I'm doing this and I'm doing that, God, and I'm listening to the word and I'm reading the scriptures and I'm going to church, then you've turned the word of God and you've, tur you've turned your religion into toil and you've turned your religion into striving and that's the exact thing that jesus said if you're weary and heavy laden come to me i'll give you rest jesus wants to give you rest because you a lot of times are your own worst enemy you're trying to do all of these things and live up to the standard of whatever it is christianity that is empty and void and the world does not look at you as a lighthouse they look at you as a nightmare and they want to stay away from you and this is not this is not a way to live and i can tell you because over the last three years i've been living in what has been the hardest season of my life from everything from you know financial troubles to people patting you on your leg in a patronizing way when you say your husband's gonna live and not die and they tap you on your leg and say, just live your life. When you have that kind of stuff happening to you and you're constantly tormented with thoughts and worries and fears and doubts and you, you don't know, uh, there's so much instability. And literally what's been the hardest three years of my life and striving and struggling and saying I was in faith and saying I was believing and I was trusting God, but it was almost like I was trying to convince myself of it because I didn't really feel like I was there. I didn't really feel like I was in the place of knowing that God was going to take care of me and in the place of knowing that God was going to take care of Dustin and in the place of knowing that everything was going to be okay. I wasn't really there. It was like I was trying to talk myself into it. And in a sense, I'm calling out my own hypocrisy because it wasn't okay. And what happened almost a year ago to the day from now, I was diagnosed with something and a, a bunch of other health problems, which came as a result of striving in the flesh, trying to be in faith in my flesh. You can't do that, it doesn't work. And over the last year, knowing that striving and stress and worry and doubt and fear were all my problems, but not really knowing how to deal with them, you can't go on like that forever. Our bodies are not meant to handle that kind of stress and that kind of pressure and that kind of misery. They're not built for that. They're built for love and trust and caring and depending on our Father. And so a few weeks ago, um, Dustin was going in to get a report from a PET scan and I was just, it, I was a wreck. I was just a wreck. I was just having a feeling of dread and misery. And even though I was like, yes, I believe, I was still having this feeling of dread and misery. And I finally was like, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna just seek God about this. What a concept. And so I started every night just, after everybody goes to sleep, just turning on, the, turning on music, no words, just music, worship music without words, and just praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit. And you know, if you can't sleep at night because you're worried, 
maybe try a different routine before bedtime because see, this was my problem. I couldn't sleep because I was worried and stressed and here I am laying in bed, wasting time thinking about things I can't change. And instead I could be talking to God about them and he can change them. So I started just every night, everybody went to bed, including my husband, everybody, the house is silent, just spending time praying, talking to him, worshiping him, being in his presence, letting him talk to me, crying, laughing, praising, being miserable, whatever I needed to be, because he is not just God. He's your dad. He's your caretaker. He's your doctor. He's your, he's your everything. He's your provider. And so here I am almost three years of striving and toiling and doing my checklist of God, I've done everything. And yet the whole time, all he wanted me to do was come to him. All he wanted me to do was come and lay my burdens out before him and say, you are my resting place. I don't care if anything else changes. I don't care what my circumstances say. Things can be the worst that they've ever been, but I don't care. I don't care. Getting to this place where as long as I have you, that's enough. And you know, we hear people say this and we hear people talk about it and it sounds all nice and you can, you know, whatever. But the truth is that it's available to you. And guess what? You're gonna be a lot better of a person in general if you're going to the source of life every single day. It doesn't have to be, you know, I always felt even like that. Like I felt like, okay, I'm gonna worship and prayer. I felt like prayer was an obligation. Like. I have to get up, you know, you hear these people that get up at like four o'clock in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I didn't want to get up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if I get up at four o'clock in the morning, my kids are going to wake up and then they're going to be up with me. It's not going to be a blessing for anyone. So for me, the nighttime was the best because nighttime is where everybody's sleeping. It's where I would normally do all my worrying. <laughs> and so I replaced my worry time with doing this. and. When you go to him, you can be who you are. You can say how you feel. You can talk to him. You can have conversations with him. You can let him answer you. And you can trade all of your worries and anxieties and fears and doubts for the peace. And then once you do that, out of that peace and out of that rest, is where new things are born. Our flesh profits nothing, that's what the Bible says. So if we're doing our religion in our flesh, it will profit nothing. And the other night I was like, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that you did not give me the thing that I want when I was in the midst of my striving. Because then I'm gonna have to preach that this is how you get things by striving. I'm gonna have to teach people who's gonna do this. This is hell. I'd rather take a happy pill or get drunk, honestly. This is hell. Who's gonna do this? Nobody, nobody's gonna do this. And so if I had to sit there and receive this by toiling and striving and stress and making myself sick, then I'm doing something wrong and thank God he did not give me what I wanted during me trying to do it myself. He couldn't, the truth is he couldn't. But now I'm at a point where I'm like, there's a switch that's happened where I know that I'm not trying to talk myself into the promises being true and that everything's gonna be okay and he's working all this out for my good and everything I need is gonna be there. I'm not talking myself into it anymore. I'm not trying to convince myself of it. I know it's true. I know it's true. I'm confident. Why? Because I've gotten to know on a new level the heart of my father. I've gotten to know that he is my resting place. He is my joy. He's my companionship. He is everything. And so you can know the word up and down. And I believe that if you're a word person, like we are here, this is probably your biggest temptation, your biggest struggle, your biggest trial, is that you know the word and you know it here, but you're not seeing it manifest here. 
And I've seen so many things manifest in my life in the past, but this has been the hardest thing and the longest thing. It's one thing I see people when they're in a trial and it's like a two month trial and they're all positive and they're all like, yes, Jesus, you're, you're amazing. Go God, glory to God. And they're all excited. And I'm like, there's a wait. <laughs> I'm like, just a wait. You're all cheerful now. I was too in the beginning. Now I'm a jaded and bitter old woman. But really, the, it, it's, it has led to better things because the truth is that these trials force us, they push the religion out of us. Trials and struggles and hardship, they force the religion out of us. And if we don't have the relationship with Jesus face to face with him, we don't have anything because Jesus came to restore the relationship. So we're trying to live under an old covenant, covenant when we have a new, better covenant. And I know this is so simple that some of you guys are like, probably like seriously dumb, but we have to get back to the basics of this stuff. We have to get back to the simplicity of just loving Jesus for who he is, experiencing him for ourselves, not coming to him as a victim or as a poor me, but coming to him saying, God, I know you love me and you're my father. And so I'm coming to you because I need rest. And you said that I can come to you if I need rest. And so that's why I'm coming to you. So if we're burned out, we're stressed. Well, you don't understand. I don't have time. Well, then you need to make time because you will die. And I'm not saying that as a prophetic judgment. I'm saying that stress will kill you. Literally, it kills your physical body to be under stress and anxiety and misery and bitterness and anger and frustration. It will literally kill you. And I've experienced a small degree of it. And you know, after going through all of this and, and, and I'm, I'm healed now, I'm not taking medications for the thing. And they said, you know, with all this stuff, you have to take medication the rest of your life. Well, all my symptoms are gone. I don't have any symptoms. I'm healed. I'm not on any medication. But it comes from a confidence in knowing we have to know the word. We have to. Because if Satan can deceive you into thinking something doesn't belong to you, and see, that was a big part of my problem too. If Satan can deceive you into thinking that this certain thing doesn't belong to you, yes. then you won't be able to enter into the rest because you won't know if it really is true. So if, if Satan can say to you, well, did, is it really God's will to heal you? Is it really God's will, you know, protection? Is protection really what God offers? Does God really want you to be blessed? Does God really want your husband to be healed? Are you allowed to believe for his healing? You're not allowed to believe for his healing. He has to believe for his own healing. See, this was what my problem was. He has to believe for his own healing. You can't believe for his healing. And then I realized, wait a second. Oh, hey. Oh, see, you've been stealing and killing and destroying a lot of things in my life in the last three years. And you are not stealing or killing or destroying my husband. You are not stealing or killing or destroying me. You are not stealing or killing or destroying my kids. And so therefore I do have the right and I do have the authority to resist you because see, unknowingly I had opened the door. I was not resisting him because I didn't know if I had the right to resist him. And then I realized Anywhere where he's stealing or killing or destroying in your life, you have the right to resist him. So you better do it. Amen. And guess what? You resist the devil and he will flee and then you can enter into the rest confidently knowing that he's going to do it for you. But you can't have one without the other. You have to have both. And so I say this because, okay, so all this happened. I've been really just resting and and I asked my husband yesterday because I hadn't told him that I had been doing this and that I had been praying and seeking God and, you know, he's asleep by then and the kids are asleep and everything. And um, I asked him yesterday, like, do you notice anything different about me? <laughs> oh, man. I'm like, do you notice anything different about me? And he's like, at first he's like, well... He's looking for like an action or something, like something I do to be different. And yeah, and he's like, well, I don't, I, I don't know. And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> and he's like, well, it does feel a lot calmer. And I'm like, okay, I will take that. 
I will say that it does feel a lot calmer. And I, that's how I feel. I feel a lot more peaceful. I feel a lot more at rest. You know, this is a trickle down effect onto your kids. You know, my kids, both of them tonight were worshiping. I don't know if you saw Hazel in the back row worshiping. She never does that. They, they were both worshiping and they don't, that's not something they've done before. And so I do believe that that is flowing downwards. They're, they're, whether they realize it or not, they're feeling the peace. Usually they, Hazel, she's a little bit prideful still, so she had to do it back there where nobody can see her, but whatever, we'll take it. Okay, it's better than nothing. <laughs> but the truth is this has a trickle down effect. This is affecting our kids. And so if we're not, if we're not effectively resisting the devil, if we're not effectively resting in his presence and allowing him to speak to us, then we are in a danger zone. We are in Satan 